You're listening to TBR Radio Presents the Dixie Heritage Hour with your host, the director of Dixie Heritage, Dr. Ed DeVries. Regular listeners remember a couple of weeks ago we had as our guest Guy Malone, the Christian ufologist who appeared in the Alien Deception film in theaters nationwide. Uh, he also recently gave a talk at Roswell, at Galacticon, and at the UFO Festival. He is the director of Roswell Mission. And uh, he has been a regular feature in the uh, UFO community for a number of years now. And uh, we ran out of time in our interview. And so, uh, as I said in that interview, that he and I would continue talking. We would continue recording the interview. And the remainder of what we would record would be broadcast on a future date. And so that's what we're going to do for today's show. We're going to play the remainder of the interview with Guy Malone. Before we get into that interview, I want to play the trailer for the Alien Intrusion movie uh, that was in theaters here just a couple of months ago. And of course, Guy appears in that trailer, and it'll kind of give you an idea of the film as we speak about it. And, uh, and then after that, of course, we'll pick up our interview with Guy Malone. Our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. These objects have been tracked since the early 1950s, if not earlier, traveling up to 7,000 miles per hour, making right angle turns at high rates of speed. With all due respect to the Air Force, I believe that some of them will prove to be of interplanetary origin. Our commanders and all told us, just keep your mouth shut about it. We can't say it did it or it didn't. So for 64 years, I've been trying to explain what we saw. And you're the first guys that really want to know what I saw. Well, I have interviewed hundreds of people who claim to have had amazing sightings, including those who claim to have been abducted. If we go back to, say, the Middle Ages in England, we get reports of fairies, of goblins, of little creatures, and they parallel eerily today's abduction experiences with the so-called greys. I think we're dealing with beings that are creating a meme to sow the seeds of belief in extraterrestrials when in reality there's something extremely different. For me, the experiences really started with what I would call manifestations. You can't do anything. They're in total control. I became paralyzed and the entity or whatever it was that was doing this to me was laughing at me and I was so afraid. I didn't know what to do. I can't remember whether I said, Jesus, 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 or Jesus, help me, Jesus, help me. But at that instant, my experience stopped, and I hit the bed, which woke my wife up, and she asked me what I was doing jumping on the bed. If these actually are extraterrestrial entities flying millions of light years across space, why would they be afraid of the name of Jesus and run from you when you bring him up? I think you'll find the truth. It's a lot stranger than most people realize. Here, not because of my views or my research primarily, but as an experiencer of the of what people call alien abduction. I'm in the, I'm interviewed, as you know, because you saw it. There's about five or six people that are interviewed that have experienced some type of alien abduction or what people call alien abduction. My hypothesis, my conclusion, was that it was really a demonic experience. It was it was being tormented by spirits that just in this day and age, they claim to be aliens from other planets. Whereas hundreds of years ago, it was incubus or succubus, or it was fairies. It was the we people, so to speak. You think of medieval era Europe. We know of Ireland and England. People reported the fairies, little people with big black eyes that would abduct or take unsuspecting loners away to caves or away to the woods. They'd poke them with magic wands. There may or may not be lewd sexual encounters uh, incorporated into the stories. And then they were returned to society just a little bit crazier for the experience with their, their tall tales of the fairy people or of elves. 
and all of a sudden. So my belief nowadays is that this this phenomena has always been at the fringe elements of our culture. Uh, every society throughout history seems to have this little lunatic fringe story of mischievous sprites, jinns, genies, elves, or fairies that, that is part of the human lore. I think it's a spiritual paranormal phenomena, you know, more closely accurately described as demonic in Christian parlance, and that that same phenomena that was elves and fairies 500 years ago is just now presenting itself as aliens from other planets to people today. But it's the same thing, little people with big black eyes that take you away and, and do things and, and, and try to drive you crazy. And what Alien Intrusion successfully did was interview and feature people with that testimony, but unlike the rest of the UFO community out there that's promoting, aliens are here, aliens are real, aliens are doing this to people, what, um, Alien Intrusion, the movie centered in on, was here's four or five people who claim to have stopped the experience in the name of Jesus, that it's like a deliverance or an exorcism, that when you invoke with power and authority the name of Jesus against the entities, when they're doing this stuff to you, they let you go, they drop you in your bed, they put you back where you were, and if you were ever going anywhere in the first place, I think it's a much more visionary experience, real, but you know, dreamscape, third world, astral, second heaven, third heaven. People can come up with a billion different terms for it. But I actually, in my cases, I mean, I am an abduction experiencer. My book, you know, it recounts many experiences I had in childhood that involved these entities. And my conclusion is I don't think I ever went anywhere at all. I don't think I ever left my bedroom, you know, so to speak, to have these experiences at night. The Bible even, if you, uh, Daniel chapter four, I like the way he phrases it. His encounter with a watcher, if you're in the King James Version, it'll just say angel or holy one in other versions. But he says, the visions in my head upon my bed that he is having experiences in the Bible with an angel, a holy one. He goes out of his way to specify a holy one. So I, I really think that the unholy ones, what we call loosely, using the term loosely fallen angels and what we loosely uh, term semantics wise demons. I think they're doing the same visionary experiences to create what people call the alien abduction phenomena and myself and the people in alien intrusion and then all the world's famous abductees that have had books written about them. I, I think the experience is happening. I just don't think it's aliens anymore. So alien intrusion does a great job of featuring those people. And unlike any other piece of literature, movie, or DVD you find in the alien world, it actually says that Christians are able to stop the experience in the name of Jesus Christ. And the other person in the film, Joe Jordan, that was featured as the, the Mutual UFO Network researcher, he's actually documented over a hundred case testimonies he's gotten from people stopping the alien abduction experience in the name of Jesus. So what kind of we did this summer that, um, because he was in the film and because I was in the film and we've worked together and done events in Roswell, we were able to, uh, from Creation Ministries, get a, a copy of the film and enter it in Roswell, New Mexico's Sci-Fi Film Festival. It's the Galacticon event that sort of runs concurrent the same weekend of the UFO Festival. It, it's two different events, but Galacticon is this thing that's growing every year and getting bigger and bigger. It's not as hardcore UFO alien. It's not your Stanton Friedman, your UFO museum kind of speakers. It's way more sci-fi, fantasy, cosplay, comic book genre. Uh, and it's fun. You know, people in colorful costumes, uh, and uh, they kind of team up with the UFO festival, but it's held at a different uh, area of town. It draws its own thousands of people now. So I've been more affiliated with the uh, Galacticon, and they were under their umbrella. Joe and I did talks this year, and we played the movie Alien Intrusion as part of the Sci-Fi Film Festival. And then we made ourselves available after the film, showing two times that weekend for question and answer of anybody that saw the film. What was funny is uh, the, the guy that was over at the film festival, when I walked in uh, to the Alien Intrusion movie, we, we played Alien Intrusion, I showed up at the end as someone who was in the film that people had seen. Hey, that's that guy that was telling his abduction stories. Um, I just pop up. I walk 
at the end. Of, Hi, I'm Guy. You may have seen me in the movie there. Um, Joe and I are over uh, at the next room over here if you want to come and uh, talk to us about it afterwards or ask any questions. And when I was walking out, right before the credits were rolling, uh, the guy that was over the thing, he goes, oh, hey, did you hear that um, some people were offended at this movie? <laughs> I'm like, uh, well, no, sir, I didn't hear that, but it doesn't surprise me. He goes, yeah, uh, some people walked out during the movie. I'm like, oh, yeah, three people walked out from my talk. It doesn't uh, offend me or bother me, but did they create a scene or did they cause you any trouble? He was like, no, no, I just want you to know that they were offended. I'm like, oh, okay. And right as he's telling me that, people start walking out from the movie ending. Woman walks right up and hugs me and says, thank you for doing that. That was incredible. And then another couple comes out and thanks him for allowing the movie to be shown, giving an alternate point of view. So it kind of balanced out. You know, anything having to do with Christianity or anything that, that might somehow disprove someone's pet doctrine or, or pet theory, whether it's about aliens or anything, yeah, it's going to be controversial. Yeah, people are going to be upset. The, the overall, the the results were good. I mean, nobody threw stones. Nobody <laughs> booed me again when I walked out in at the end of the movie. Say hi, I'm Guy. Come and see us. Uh-huh. You know, there's still plenty of people in the theater who watched it till the end. But um, yeah, that that was the event we did this year. In short, the way I phrased it at the opening was the movie Alien Intrusion, as seen in theaters nationwide, and is now global. It's now on DVD. And it's being presented here in Roswell once again in a theater during the film festival. And Joe and I are in the movie. So we are here today to do the lectures that got us in the movie to begin with. And so we each did some talks, played the movie. And then Joe flew in his son from Florida, who's a professional video guy, to record our talks for uh, YouTube and DVD in very, very high quality. Something that would be on a par with what Creation uh, Ministries did uh, with the Alien Intrusion movie. You know, the, the graphics are nice. It's just PowerPoints that he and I use during our talks. And then our our talks themselves, our, our own original content that made us interview worthy uh, for the Alien Intrusion film. So it's, uh, all together, it's a very nice uh, uh, thing to present to the public. So are those talks available at roswellmission.org? Or how do people get a hold of those? Yeah, actually, they will be very, very soon. But yeah, roswellmission.org and Joe's site, ce4research.com, either do or very soon will have information on. Uh, generally, we just put the DVDs, we just put the YouTubes out there for people to view for free. You know, well, it's uh, what the Bible says, freely you've received, freely give. Um, Joe personally put a lot of money into flying in from Korea, into flying in his son, and, you know, uh, shipping all of his cameras uh, to record this for us. Um, we're going to put it on YouTube for free viewing. And yes, it's available in hard copy DVD if you want it in that format. And yes, that will cost money. More or less, our, our approach has always been we, we give it away for free and let God take care of the books from there. So if you if you love what we do and you want to see us do more of it, you can support either with a donation of any amount, or you can buy the DVDs that will very soon, I'm pretty sure, be made available. Maybe a week, maybe a month, but the the links will be up there for previewing fairly fairly soon as well. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to stick a commercial in here for our sponsor, The Barnes Review. That'll last about 60 seconds, and then we'll be back with more of our interview with Guy Malone uh, from the Alien Intrusion movie and the director of RoswellMission.org. And we'll kind of change gears a little bit and uh, start to explore some other If topics. you love listening to the Dixie Heritage Hour, then I know that you'll love reading The Barnes Review. The Barnes Review is one of my favorite magazines. I began reading The Barnes Review long before they became a sponsor here on the program. In The Barnes Review, you will read Vignettes of Man from the prehistoric to the very recent, from forgotten races and civilizations to first-person accounts of World War II and the late Cold War. There's just not a more interesting magazine published today nor a more significant and important subject than real history. So if you'll visit www.barnesreview.org, that's www.barnesreview.org, you can find out how you too can become a subscriber to the Barnes Review. You can subscribe to receive the Barnes Review by mail, or you can subscribe to receive the Barnes Review electronically in PDF editions. 
or you can subscribe to receive both. That's what I do. So visit www.barnesreview.org and subscribe to the Barnes Review. Do you have a radio show right now? I don't. I've, uh, you know, I've, I've done it back and forth. I've toyed with it. Ten years ago or more, I was doing live from Roswell uh, weekly on UPRN, and that was a podcast as well as a radio program. And when I moved back to Roswell, I, I did it again, uh, like 20, less than 30 episodes. But it just, uh, time-wise, I, I, really, I had to work for a living is, is the best uh, short answer for that. I had to increase my work schedule here in town just to pay bills and get along, basically. So I, I still hold on to the URL, and I'm not sure what I'm going to do with it in the future. I w- I'd probably like to do it again at some point in the future, but not currently. You know, we talked about NASA earlier, and I was up at Kennedy Space Center, oh, I want to say back in February. Oh, yeah. Actually spent the night there with a group of fifth graders. <laughs> and uh, it was one of those things where uh, where uh, the fifth grade class at my son's school was able to spend the night uh, underneath the Saturn V rocket. That would be really cool. Yeah, and they needed chaperones and things, and and so we were up there for uh, almost, you know, like almost a whole day, you know, then overnight, and then almost the whole next day. And, um, you know, to some extent, it's almost, you know, I almost wonder if NASA didn't hire somebody over at Disney to redesign that place, because it's, it's, (laughs) it's, you know, it's more, and I, I had been to Johnson Space Center years ago, and I had been to Kennedy Space Center years ago as well, but it's almost like an amusement park now. Oh, good. Well, I mean, that makes it easier for people to come and actually enjoy themselves. That makes it more of a tourist attraction. It's really funny, though, the that you said from Disney, because, hey, as the conspiracy uh, theorists know, mm-hmm. there is a long-standing connection between uh, Disney, Walt Disney, the, the mm-hmm. original guy himself, and Warner Von Braun, and... Uh, the uh, German Nazi side of the uh, space program from way, way, way back. I, I think they've been in cahoots to kind of uh, maybe deceive a little bit and push a certain type of propaganda related to space travel or maybe even aliens themselves. The connection between Nazi Germany paperclip scientist Warner von Braun and Walt Disney is there to be found, though. There's photos of them, and whether Disney was... Do you remember years and years ago, there was like an NBC one-hour program? This is like UFO folklore at this point now. Disney aired a documentary with the actor, gosh, Robert Ulbrich or something like that. He was was in that TV show Vegas, but uh, really promoting the idea of life on other planets and using Disney's animation to back something that NASA was saying. It appeared on the air, and then it just disappeared again real quick. It was A lot of people now label it as a propaganda piece to, to push the idea of aliens. It's a real... Uh, I, I don't know if it can still be found on YouTube. That's something I, I might want to look into. Disney's propaganda piece on aliens with NASA or something like that. That is in the history of UFO conspiracy archives, though. Well, I'll tell you my personal belief... And that is that the moon landing was shot at a, at a Disney soundstage in California. Oh, I'm not too far from that belief myself. I, I'm not at all... Con- sorry. I mean, if, if everything else I said has sounded barely credible to people, I am not convinced, <laughs> I'm not convinced we ever went to the moon. Mm-hmm. I, hate to mi- I hate to mix all these together. It's like, oh, great, you had me until you went there, is what a lot of people are going to... Suppose you're a flat earther, too, or... Or I suppose you think our tax dollars are going to blah, 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 whatever people are going to say. Mm-hmm. So I hate sometimes to introduce one topic on top of another on top of another because it kind of shoots your credibility. But I'm with right. you on that. Now, I, I, I think the moon landing was a fake. Mm-hmm. I'm there. Do you know that actor um, that got punched in the nose for uh, by one of the astronauts for... Uh, trying to get him to swear on a on a Bible that he went to the moon, and the guy <laughs> punched him on camera. Have you ever seen that? No, I haven't. His name's Bart Sabrell. I knew him when I lived in Nashville. <laughs> well, my third cousin, 
and he lives not too far from you now. He's a used car dealer. He's retired, actually. But And the last time I, I – I can't remember how many years ago it was, the last time I, I really talked to him in any length now. But um, even as a kid at family reunions, he did not want to talk – he would talk about the Gemini, you know, program all, all day long. You know, if you wanted to hear astronaut stories, he would, you know – when I was a little kid, he was more than happy to, you know, regale me with them. But uh, he did not want to talk about the Apollo program. And what would he know about? Why would he be? Are you saying he had knowledge of it? Was uh, he, he was one of the Apollo 7 astronauts. Oh, my. <laughs> he wouldn't say a word about it, though, huh? No. The, the only thing that he would say with any definition was that the reason that he passed on later Apollo missions, you know, I asked him, you know, why he didn't, you know, actually, you know, why he didn't go to the moon, you know. He he, he would rather be the guy who didn't go to the moon than, than you know, be the guy who died trying. Oh, yeah, there's uh, the launch pad explosion. You know about that angle, don't you? Yeah. And, yeah, um, yeah the, the two astronauts who were, I think I think he was Christian, actually, uh, who was actually criticizing NASA, saying we are still ten years away from the moon? There's no like in 1967, saying yeah. there's no way the science isn't there, the math. There's no way we're still we're not go. We're at least ten years away. But he was like one of the top astronauts that that, that should have gone. Mm -hmm. We should know his name as easily as we know Neil Armstrong now. He actually told his wife something along the. I I don't know the story that well, not without looking refreshing looking up. But he actually told his wife, if something happens to me, kind of conversation mm -hmm. that she's on record with now. A few days later, he was blown up on, an, on a launch pad. That is sad. And then, a year or two later, these all-new recruits come in. Mm -hmm. You may know Masons, uh, Freemasons. Uh -huh. the, the, the level of connection, everyone that's allegedly been to the moon, um, I think every one of them is a Mason, and it's documented. That's a, that is not a hard thing to Google or find out now. A lot of people are publicizing that. So you, it makes you wonder, why does this one single secret organization, are, why are they the only ones that get to go to the moon? And, and do we necessarily have to believe what one very specific secret organization with an agenda has to tell us about uh, space flight or moon or whatever like that? That is a whole different topic. I'm surprised you were... Uh, even willing to introduce that in this interview or want to go there. And again, roswellmission.org has nothing to say about the moon landing itself. <laughs> the opinions expressed by Guy Malone <laughs> may not be reflected in what I teach on the alien side of stuff. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I've got my own political beliefs and conspiracy beliefs and spiritual beliefs that, you know, as, you know, we all. You remember the good old days when all we had to fight about was the rapture? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, now you got to, if you don't pick a side on 20 different issues, you know, or, or if you pick a different side on, it won't take long of getting to know someone before you realize how vehemently you disagree with them on some point or topic. So I, I think that's part of the amazing design of the body of Christ. No one person has it all right, mm -hmm. and just because one person is really, really wrong on one thing doesn't mean you throw out the baby with the bathwater on, on their teachings or their ministry. We just, if the only person that had it all together was Jesus, and you know, we killed him for it, right. because you know, that, that amount of perfection in one person is just impossible to be around. I asked it to you by email once, and you didn't, you didn't talk to me again for a couple months. <laughs> Oh, that's me on email, though. <laughs> and, uh, and and I've asked this question to a couple of other people, and I can tell that it's a question that they didn't want to have to answer. In fact, oh, shoot. It's, it's a question that nobody's ever answered for me before. It may have been that I just didn't want to take the time to type out whatever <laughs> response. <Okay. laughs> so so I, got the, I got the feeling that this is like the question that's dreaded by, for lack of a better term, Christian ufologists. And, and the question is this, is... Okay, if we were to find out tomorrow, and, and you know, I, I agree, you know, with the science in the Alien Intrusion movie that, 
you know, I think if anything else, that movie and that book probably did a pretty good job of proving that intergalactic space travel is, is all but impossible. With current science knowledge, I, I will add that disclaimer. Yeah. I mean, look at Kitty Hawk. You know, they did the impossible. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure if what we know about science today, you know, defines the limits. So I'm always a little wee bit towards the, well, what we know about science might right. be disproven. If a spaceship landed on the lawn of the White House tomorrow... And, you know, little gray men, you know, walk down a little ramp. <clears throat> um, you know, I would be inclined to believe that they were demons. I, I would. Yeah. But at the same time, if we were to determine that, that there is other planets with other sentient beings on them, that would not destroy my faith in the Bible. In other words, my, 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 whole, my whole sense of, of, of creation and Christianity and the gospel... Um, is not going to, to just go poof because there's there's you know sentient beings on another planet somewhere. Right. But I get the feeling that there are a lot of and again I know this isn't the term they'd want to be called by, but I don't know what else to call them. Christian ufologists, but you know, guys like Gary, um, you know, guys like Joe, yourself and, and guys who do this on a lot deeper level even than you do. You know, I get the impression that that um you know, a lot of them are hell-bent that there cannot be life on any other planet. Ours is the only planet with sentient, you know, whatever. And that uh, suggests that, that it could be possible just just blows up their whole whatever. <laughs> they don't even want to entertain the question. Why is that? Is, okay. uh, a, you're right that Gary has gone on record and, uh, for whatever reason. I, I can't firmly agree with myself in saying that if life on other planets was proven, he would throw out his Bible. Because his understanding, and really my my theological view from what I know of the Bible, is that I, I end my, my presentation, in fact, with a kind of a drawn out, uh, what does the Bible say about life elsewhere? And, and I really am of the opinion that the Bible is a very geocentric work. That the, the lights in the sky, when you look at Genesis 1, God tells us why they're there. And it's for us. Let them be for lights. Let them be for seasons. To mark this, that, the other thing. And then uh, Isaiah, he says, I created the earth to be inhabited. I, the Lord, did this. To where, you know, when you, when you put those together, I call it, it, it sells a lot better when you see me do it with power, PowerPoints and as part of a logical progression of where I've taken things, then I'm going to be able to do it justice here. But I, I say I create, I made up this thing called the doctrine of stated intent. <laughs> that when God specifically tells us something, why something is the way it is, it's not that open to interpretation all of a sudden. Um, and I give, a, I give an example, which I'll skip here. But in the example where God says, let there be lights in the sky four seasons, four light on the earth. Let the stars do this and let them be for that. And then when he says in Isaiah, I, the Lord, I created the earth to be inhabited. If all that other stuff was created to be inhabited, whether or not God has to say so is his own business. But he only says that he created the earth to be inhabited. So that's sound biblical doctrine. God created the earth to be inhabited. It's also sound biblical doctrine that God created the sun and the moon and the stars to give light on the earth and to help us mark seasons. That is sound biblical doctrine as to why they're there. Whether they are or whether they could be inhabited is speculative at best. It is unsound doctrine to say that they are inhabited, though. So you have to really go beyond and you actually have to oppose what the Bible does state as truth to put life anywhere else related to those stars and lights and skies that we see in that we see in our sky. So, for starters, I encourage people to speak sound doctrine. God created the earth to be inhabited and he put the stars there to give us light and to mark seasons and shut up right there. That is sound doctrine that when you say that, you are agreeing. Your the words coming out of your mouth are agreeing with what God's word says. If you ask, is there life elsewhere? Well, of course, there could be. There's no evidence of it. And then I'll add, there's no, there's nothing in the Bible to support that idea. And then shut up. 
don't throw in your human opinion. The, the, well, if God is God, he could have done anything, I suppose. Yeah, he could have. You know, a, a 12-year-old can tell you that. That is not a deep theological statement, though. That is not something a pastor should say, because he's he's gone into the realm of his imagination. And the Bible tells us casting down vain imaginations and anything that opposes the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God is that he created the earth to be inhabited, and that he created the stars and the sun and the moon to give us light and to mark seasons. That's what the Bible says, and that's where, that's where I will stop with my theological opinion. I won't speculate that God, you know, nothing's too hard for God. We all know that. That's sound doctrine. That's the word of God. God, the definition of God is he can do what he wants to. You're not imparting any theological revelation, or you're not adding to the conversation by saying God can do anything because a 12-year-old knows that, okay? So I encourage pastors, Christians, teachers, whatever, to not go there, to not use what their imagination can conceive, because God is not obliged to do something just because you or I can imagine it. Right. He tells us what he did do in the Bible. So if you go into the realm of imagination, you got to remember, the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not unto your own understanding. The Bible tells us, casting down vain imaginations. We're not supposed to answer from our imagination. On When someone says, as a Christian, what do you believe? You're, 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 you're free as a Christian to believe that it's okay for homosexuals to marry. If you want to believe that, hey, this is America, you're a sovereign individual, you may be right, you may be wrong, you can do. But if, if, if I or someone comes to you and asks you, as a Christian, what do you think about homosexual marriage? For example, fill in the blank, any topic. There's the underlying assumption that the answer you're supposed to give to that person, because they ask you as a Christian, what do you believe or what do you think, that there's going to be something biblical about what the next thing that comes out of your mouth. Right. They're coming to you because they want what the Bible says. You are the only representation of God and Christ in many people's lives. So if you have an opinion that goes against the Word of God, keep it to yourself. And you're free to have it, but don't teach it from the pulpit and don't tell people, as a Christian, I believe. So when people come around and say, well, I'm a Christian and I have no problem with, you know, there could be life elsewhere. Well, I don't either. There could be. But what I do have a problem with is you teaching that as a Christian, because that's really the Bible doesn't support that belief. You should you should say out of your mouth, what does the Bible say that God created the earth to be inhabited? And they created the stars to give us light and mark seasons. And then shut up. Let the Holy Spirit impart revelation about other stuff. But, okay, so well, with that said, when you're asking what I know about the Bible, everything that I just said is my limited human knowledge. And what I believe about a variety of topics, biblical or not, is admittedly in many ways different what I believed about that same topic 10, 15, 20 years ago. Let's go back to the rapture, you know. You know, we, if you haven't changed your mind on some theological topic in 20 years, it's because you're not studying the word of God. It's cuz you're not in the book itself, right? You know, we all learn and we all grow. Glory to glory and we're achieving perfection, but none of us are there yet. So my knowledge of what the, of what the Bible says is finite. It's limited. I am limited to my current today understanding right. in proportion to the amount of time I've spent in God's Word and in prayer. And, and the same is true of science. So if somehow or other, you gave the example of if a spaceship lands on a White House lawn and an entity comes out, you said it might, you'd think it would be demons. I'd be inclined to agree with that possibility or that it could be something scientists grew in a lab for the purpose of it may not it may not be a demon but it was something that ungodly scientists created in a lab through cloning and genetic experimentation to hoist a deception on all of us whether a demon entered that thing's body or not that's what i think some christian ufologists you say that they think is going to happen that that all the, um, the the demonic spirits, uh, that, that bodies are being created for them right now for demon hordes to occupy and pull off the grand deception of aliens 
So I will keep that on the table as a possibility as well. It would really be difficult, though, to prove life on other planets without going there, without being able to take me there. If you're going to make the claim that there's life on other planets, I'm not going to believe you just because you got the name NASA on your badge. I've already, you and I have already talked about why NASA may or may not be trustworthy in what, in what they say or in what agendas they promote. So just because NASA says there's dolphins on Europa, all I'm going to say is, okay, well, the Bible doesn't say that. Mm -hmm. And I, if NASA wants to give me a free ticket, now I might respond like your relative did and, and pass. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, but if they make it to where independent scientists and individuals, I mean, there's nothing stopping you or I from going to the Grand Canyon right now to test scientific claims. We don't rely on National Geographic only to tell us everything about the world. Because anything National Geographic publishes, you or I or a team of scientists can go and verify and say yes or no. National Geographic is lying. I think the American public and the global public should treat NASA the same way. Just because they say something, they are not infallible. They don't have carte blanche. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I might even phrase this as a, uh, uh, if you're putting it only in Christian terms, it, well, if NASA says there's life on other planets, therefore you have to believe it. I'm going to turn around and say to you, okay, well, as a Christian pastor, it is adherence to what NASA declares required for fellowship in this church, right. or is, is adherence to what the Bible declares the barometer for fellowship? Okay, is, is adherence to what NASA says required to be in leadership at this church? Is it required for uh, a leadership position? You know, because people can have opinions that are unbiblical and they're still in leadership. They can have habits, hobbies, sins. Some do or do. And that, that, that's my challenge, though, is, oh, well, NASA says there's, uh, I think Gary has used the phrase. Gary has said, if, if we find out that there's dolphins swimming on Europa, no, that doesn't really mess with his faith. Or there's microbial life on Mars that doesn't mess with his faith. Uh, I actually, I'm not sure that I would believe if NASA said there's microbial life on Mars or if NASA said there's dolphins on Europa. I think those are incremental steps. And I think they are so-called discoveries leading to a grand deception that there's life on other planets and it's here. And they're here to show us the way. Throw out your Bibles now. Well, I know because. yesterday Fox News was reporting that supposedly they found a, an underground lake on the planet Mars. On the planet Mars, yeah. <laughs> One meter deep. Don't really pack your trunks yet, yeah. <laughs> is what someone else I read was saying. If you want to really uh, have some fun with the topic, if you want to follow what I will say is the desensitization, type into Google News and get daily alerts for life beyond Earth. Earth. There is story after story after story after story pummeling uh, the worldwide press that uses the phrase life beyond Earth. And it's all NASA this, NASA that, and, polit and theory and this, that, the other thing. Um, there's no science to it yet. I think I did a good job in the talk I did um, mm -hmm. this year that you can, uh, you'll, you'll have access to eventually. I showed a, a quite a few scientific articles that were very recent to where some scientists are standing up and waving their arms and saying, hey, life beyond Earth has not been proven yet. It is not a foregone conclusion. It's really bad science to assume that it's true based on these probabilities or these Drake equations, you know, Fermi paradox. There, there, there's great articles out there now by real scientists who are trying to remind the scientific community, no, it's not been proven, but... You know, your original question is, I don't think it would destroy my faith if any announcement or any so-called, I'll say, proof was offered that there is intelligent, sentient life elsewhere other than Earth somehow. It might cause me to re-examine. I'd have to see it in the Word of God in a way that I never saw before, or I'd have to have science that I could trust verifying it. And NASA alone does not earn my trust. Right. Uh, and whether I'm a conspiracy theorist or not, what I mean is no one source, you know, the, the actual essence of science is to have multiple verifiable sources declaring a thing to be true. I've been making this argument since I was a teenager. And, of course, the older I get, the more insistent I become in it. But, you know, as we study 
what's called science, and the Apostle Paul talked about the, he warned us of the dangers of science, falsely so-called. So-called, you're right, yeah. And, um, but as we, uh, you know, as we study these things that are called science, you know, and they talk about billions and billions of years ago. Well, how do they know that? Were they there? Did they observe right. it? What was, nope. Is there a testimony of a credible observer that has been passed down through history? Have they duplicated uh, it in a laboratory? The answer to all of those is no. Correct. And so if you can't document where somebody else has witnessed it, and you can't duplicate it yourself, then how is that proven? How is that a fact? It is a theory. Yeah, it's not science. It's philosophy. Yeah, exactly. But but that's what's happened is, is in my lifetime, I have seen the scientific formula change where the theories have become the science now. You're right. The theory of evolution. We always forget that the word theory yeah. is is there, mm -hmm. and that it is. It's not the law of evolution, right? You know, <laughs> we and, have and, laws. We have the law of thermodynamics. We have the law of entropy because those are things science has proven to the satisfaction of the scientific community. You know, as far as is a lot of the science that relates to space travel and so forth. You know, again, there's a lot of theory out there. Yeah. But but nobody is no, nobody is is demonstrating the reality of any of it. Uh, you mean like getting past the Van Allen belts, for example? That's a good one. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Science that's available to anybody with the internet now. You've you've got NASA astronauts talking about we can't get past the Van Allen belts. Oh, well, how did you in 1969? Never mind. <laughs> Of course, you know, we're going back to another subject now. But even when you go to NASA and they've got the lunar rover there and they've got the lunar landing module and, and you're standing within eight feet of these things, they're made out of chicken wire and tinfoil. Yeah, that's what it looks like. <laughs> but don't dare ask the tour guide, you know, how that stuff was ever possibly supposed to have worked in the harsh environment of space. Yeah. And isn't the car itself... <laughs> Lunar rover bigger than what you could fit in that module when you yeah. put them side by side? Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, so much for NASA and science then. Yeah. It's just, you, you tell me one lie, you've kind of lost my trust in general. Right. So, yeah. So, if NASA announces there's life on other planets, uh, I'm just going to – I my opinion is that it's a hoax. You know, I'm going to so throw, I'm gonna throw something gonna, else out there. All right, you're going to have to do better than NASA saying something is yeah. true. <laughs> But, uh, you know, I've taken a lot of flack through the years. An interesting story of how I, I began to come to this conclusion. Because, you know, I grew up like everybody else, just, you know, believing, I guess you could call it the Copernican theory. Mm -hmm. You know, that the, uh, the Earth, that the Earth, you know, rotates and orbits the sun and, and blah, blah, blah. 16, 17 years ago now, I was reading a sermon that was preached by John Jasper. And John Jasper was a slave. Who, slave, he, he, was a, he was a slave in Richmond, Virginia, who had been converted uh, shortly be before the war between the states. And his master freed him uh, when he had gotten saved so that he could go and preach the gospel. And he ended up uh, starting a church, which was, I want to say it was the Fifth Missionary Baptist Church of Richmond, Virginia. He ended up being the personal chaplain to Jefferson Davis during the war between the states. In fact, Davis was in one of his church services when the Yankees were taking Richmond and and he and the leaders of the Confederate government had to be evacuated and so forth. And uh, But John Jasper preached a sermon, and this was after the war. He went around the country, and they preached a ser and he preached a sermon. He mainly gave the, preached these sermons in Chicago, New York, mainly large northern cities, though. They also rented out big uh, halls for him to give the, the sermon in, in in Europe, Paris, London, and so forth. And the reason that these moneyed interests did it was so that people would mock him. Hmm. And his sermon was titled, The Sun Do Move. The what? The Sun Do Move. New Move? The Sun Do Move. Oh, okay, yeah. And, 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 he, and, and he preached, he, he, he took his text from the Psalms and how the sun runs its course around the earth. Yeah. And and he said the sun do move and the earth do not. And you know, with all of the uh passion of an old slave preacher, he articulates geocentrism 
from the Bible because he knew, you know, he he didn't understand the scientific whatever of it. He was just preaching the Bible as he understood it. And of course, like I said, that there were there were certain people who were setting him up to 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 give these uh, sermons in these large halls because it was considered entertainment of the day. But I was reading a transcript oh, so like of, so like of the sermon, and I'm thinking, you know, he's right. Uh huh. And so for about the last 15 years or so, I've, I've been a geocentrist. Yeah. And, and I take a lot of flack for that. What about Flat Earth then? Dome. Um, you know, I've not, uh, I've, I've not gone to the Flat Earth theory. Somebody asked me about that the other day, and I referred them to Isaiah 22. And when, uh, you know, even Columbus, that was supposed to be his inspiration to, to sail the route that he sailed when... The Bible says God sits upon the circle of the earth. Circle of the earth in Isaiah. Yeah. Yeah, the problem with that is that it's circle, circuit, like a compass. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 here's, the, here's the flat earth or standard reply to that nowadays already that's developed, is that a pizza is a circle. A table is a circle. A coin is a circle. None of them are a ball or a globe. Isaiah... A couple chapters before that actually uses the word ball. So there is a word in the Hebrew that could be used to describe a ball that is different and independent from the word circle. The word circle used in Isaiah there is more like we would use the word circuit, like a, a track runner running his circuit, running his circle when you're going around a track, or uh, the face of a compass is a circle. If it's going north, east, west, south, or a, a clock or a sundial, they're all flat surfaces that are circular from one perspective. Circuit. That's that's what they're going to tell you. You can send people. To, the Isaiah circle of the earth is actually the, one of the flat earthers' favorite proof points now. Okay. Because the word means circuit. And, and if Isaiah wanted to use the word ball or globe, he had one in his vocabulary, and he used it. <laughs> that that's the whole problem if, with the geocentric point of view is uh you you mentioned that the sun moves uh joshua he was told what it he stopped the sun in its orbit mm -hmm. he didn't stop the earth from spinning because gosh you know what would happen kinetic energy and you know everything would tumble if the earth stopped if it were spinning so and, you know we've got the foundations of the earth shall not be moved Oh, yeah, the other thing is, he told the moon to stop moving, too. Joshua did. He told the sun to stop, and he had to tell the moon to stop, I think, separately. And it says the moon gives her light or whatever like that. A lot of people are saying the idea that the moon reflects light from the sun is a lie of modern science as well, because the Bible says the moon has her own light. Guy and I talked at length about the flat earth theory and some of the things that people are saying now. And uh, we won't put all of that into this interview today. But I do want to say that uh, Guy is not a flat earther. He's kind of playing devil's advocate in, uh, you know, what little bit of that conversation I am including. Uh, in this radio interview, uh, he was playing devil's advocate there. And so I just wanted to put that in there so that it doesn't appear as though, uh, you know, we're putting him into a position that he does not hold. With that said, what I want to do now is I want to stick in a commercial for our sponsor, the American Free Press, and then we'll be back with our guest, Guy Malone. 26 times a year, the American Free Press newspaper can be delivered to your door, packed with the kind of uncensored news that I know you're going to appreciate. If you're ever dissatisfied with your subscription to the American Free Press, their guarantee is that you just drop them an email and they will gladly refund the unused portion of your subscription. So what are you waiting for? Visit www.americanfreepress.net. Once again, www.americanfreepress.net. But I, I, you know, I, I preached a sermon years ago, and the title of the message was "Why I Believe in Unicorns." Oh, right on. And you know, basically because I take the Bible literally. You know, David talked about about unicorns and. Uh, of course, you know, uh, if you read the NIV commentary, they say, which was written by the, the translators, they say that, uh, that that was a rhinoceros. Somehow or uh, another, I think that David would have been able to tell the difference between a rhinoceros and a unicorn. Or, or you take that even a step further, you go to the early 1600s, 
uh, you look at the men who translated the King James Bible, they were the foremost scholars of their day. And I'm, I'm sure that, that men like Miles Standish knew the difference between a unicorn and a rhinoceros and, and uh, could, okay. could and would translate accordingly. So, you know, either you believe the Bible or you don't. And, and you know, if, if people want to say that I'm crazy because I believe in unicorns, well, they're not the only creature that's become extinct over the, you know, the thousands of years of, uh, of existence since the creation. I agree with that, too. Uh, so Did we cover your, did we cover your, your extra question then on um if if life on other planets happened that you said i didn't respond to you by email oh yeah we did that, that that's no correct. christian yes, yeah sir. but no yeah christian. i just I, it seems like the question that a lot of people don't want to answer and it's like you know I, i'm not saying that there is life on other planets and i'm sure there probably isn't but it's like you know if if, it, if we find out that there was you know it's not going to change anything for me i did have one person who to the effect of, you know, if there were life on other planets, well, well, how, how would they get saved? And, you know, my answer to that was, you know, and, and, you know, so when Jesus died, did he die for everybody on our planet and every other planet, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's an irrelevant question. That's, I basically dismissed it as an irrelevant question. You know, man had sinned and needed a savior. Yeah. You know, right. that doesn't mean that, that, that whoever on whatever other of God's creations had sinned and needed a savior. And if they did, then I'm sure God would have made a vehicle for their salvation if he cared to do so. Dr. Heiser covers that really well mm -hmm. in that it's Adam's descendants that are uh, affected by, I mean, in one sense, all of creation groans because of sin. We, we know that. Mm -hmm. But his answer to that has to do with only descendants of Adam are eligible for salvation just because intelligent life exists uh, they will die the same as giraffes do giraffes dogs porpoises mm -hmm. gorillas you know these things have intelligence they demonstrate communicative ability very well if you were to say that there's an intelligent life on elsewhere that that's smarter than us while it may seem appalling to us if they're 10 times smarter than us if they can travel through so-called space and all this stuff on, on their rocket ships. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, well, on that day comes when the sun melts like wax and the stars fall from the sky. Those beings are going to die just like giraffes and gorillas on Earth are going to die and mm -hmm. dogs. But only the sons of Adam are uh, candidates for salvation. So no, they're, they're not going to be saved is the answer to that question. Wrestle with it. And like you said, if they needed to be, God has a way of doing it. Yeah. But it's it's not a tantamount to what the Bible teaches. Well, my my own personal belief is that the Van Allen radiation belt is kind of a fence that God has put around our planet. Yeah. And not only does it keep us in, it probably keeps everything else out. Yeah. Of course, you know, we could talk about how the moon landing was faked. But what I'm not inclined to believe is that hundreds of shuttle missions were faked or that even the pre-lunar missions you know, were faked. In other words, uh, you know, did uh, did the Gemini astronauts and the Mercury astronauts orbit the Earth? You know, I would say yes, they did. You know, mm -hmm. did Yuri uh, Gagarin, the Russian cosmonaut, did he go to space and come back, tell the tale? I would say yes, he did. Um, yeah. You know, is, is this the International Space Station orbiting the Earth right now? I would say it is. No, it's low Earth orbit is all. You know, there, there's miles and miles and miles and miles and miles and miles to go before you get to the Van Allen belt. Uh -huh. But I think there's a ton of arguments to show that everything that's been called science, we've been lied to in a lot of ways. And it is setting up a mass deception. You know, I I, um, I know there's a mass deception coming. I, uh, I I gave up years ago on trying to predict how it was going to how it was going to take place. You know, you talk about. Uh, yeah. We used predict to only have yeah. to argue about the rapture. The first book that I had written. I was still in college, and I wrote a book on the rapture, and I thought I understood it all. No kidding. Yeah. And officially, I've not changed my position because you don't change your theology until you absolutely have to. But that said, the more I study it, I have more questions than answers. But, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I tell people I now I'm, I'm, I'm more of a pan-millennialist and a pan-tribulationalist. And, and, right. and in that sense, is is when Jesus comes back, it all just sort of pans out. And, right. <laughs> and I have a feeling we'll be so enamored with seeing him. I don't think that anybody's going to look over at somebody else 
You know, the, in other words, the people who, who had the right position all along aren't going to look over at the people who didn't and say, I told you so. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> they'll, they'll be you know too that, enamored with Jesus to, to do that. Yeah, yeah, that's what we'll care about then. <laughs> and so is there anything else on RoswellMission.org or anything else uh, you're doing project-wise around the Internet that you want to tell us about? Or? Well, yeah, thanks. Um, you knew I was here uh, for many years um, before this came up. Uh, we had lots of conferences, actually, uh, Christian Symposium on Aliens, where not just Joe and I, but uh, Dr. Michael Heiser, Ph.D., for example, uh, Pastor William Alnor, who wrote a few Christian books on UFOs uh, before he passed, and he was also the uh, Ph.D. journalism professor at Texas A&M, founder of a Calvary Chapel, Campus Crusade for Christ, and he, uh, we recorded a couple of his talks while he was here in Roswell. Point being, on roswellmission.org, there are uh, older videos uh, that people can, uh, again, watch for free online. Uh, there's links to how to get them on DVD. I'm not even affiliated with that anymore, but there they are. And also, uh, I guess uh, maybe we should have started with this, um, but years ago, the, what brought me to Roswell was I was living in Nashville, Tennessee, when there was a cult suicide uh, that was related to aliens and the Bible, or so they claimed, uh, that is what prompted me to go public with my story. I was not, um, I was a Christian. I was saved in my 20s. A guy witnessed to me back when I was into UFOs and aliens, and it, it led me to the conclusion that my experiences were demonic, but I kept it to myself. I didn't tell people, hi, I'm an alien abductee, and here's my story. You know, I had no desire to go public with that. But after, in the late 90s, this group, Heaven's Gate, committed a, a cult suicide. And they, they, they pinned it on aliens and the Bible somehow. It's, it's a real weird muckety-muck. I won't try to drag that up. It's 20 years old. But it um, basically it inspired me, or it called me, it compelled me to take the information that I had from my testimony and my salvation experience. And I put up a web page telling my story of my experiences and my conversion to Christianity and here's what I think about it and I put it online as a web page I uh, started writing in 1997 and in 1999 I moved to Roswell with the whole thing as a book uh, Come Sail Away UFO Phenomena in the Bible and I've since reprinted it as Come Sail Away with me and the, the text from the lectures I did on the Roswell crash and my kind of Pseudo famous are aliens demons talk. So yeah, the point is you can read the whole book online for free at roswellmission.org. You asked what else is on the web page. That's what else is on the web page. You've got links to where you can uh, read my original testimony from 20 years ago that got me involved in this, and uh, God more or less called me as a missionary to Roswell. I had a couple churches of, or where I attended church in Nashville, uh, even though it sounded crazy to a lot of people. The church affirmed that, yes, we actually, we have prayed about it with you and for you, and we can affirm that God is calling you there as a, as a missionary endeavor. And they laid hands on and released me to move from Nashville to Roswell originally. And actually, they gave me $100 a month missionary support, for that matter, too. So, you know, when a church puts their money where their mouth is, you know it's kind of real or legitimate. And, uh, but the point is, the book that I wrote is also on roswellmission.org. You can click through and uh, read it uh, online. There's an Amazon link to the current uh, hard copy edition. But the current edition is three times the size of the original book because I added the 1947 Roswell Incident Lecture, which really only takes a secular approach. There's not a religious bone in the Roswell 1947. What is it? There's not a religious bone in my body. That's what I was saying about the Roswell 1947. If you take that by itself, individually, as just a lecture, there's nothing that whiffs of Christianity or religion about it. It's just history. But I include all the text and all the documentation and all the pictures, and I add them to the book. And then I have the Are Aliens Demons talk that I've developed since, in the 20 years since moving to Roswell. You know, I started with my original hypothesis in 1997 and I moved here with it in 1999 then I spent 10 then 15 years here and I wrote new material that incorporated what I've learned since moving here 
So that's what the whole book is about. You know, that's the whole 20 years worth of research in one book. Literally out of time with this. So uh, check out Guy's website, www.roswellmission.org. And check out our website, www.dixieheritage.net. And uh, let us know who you are and uh, how you're listening to the program. Also, uh, sign up for the free newsletter. We would love to send that to you every week. So from all of us here at TBR Radio presents the Dixie Heritage Hour. Until next week, God bless.